Welcome to this week's Line Opinion panelists. We're joined in studio this week by Dan McKay, a staff writer at the Albuquerque Journal. Across the table is Eric Rigo. He's a Democratic former New Mexico State Senator, now works as a policy advisor for Mayor Tim Keller. And welcome to Joel Myers, an attorney and former federal prosecutor to the table for the first time. Now we begin this week with an update in the Solomon Pena case. Police arrested the former Republican candidate and party official in January, accusing him of orchestrating a series of shootings at the homes of four Democratic officials following his election loss in November. Now, federal authorities announced charges last week against Mr. Pena and two of his alleged accomplices. Those charges include conspiracy, interference with federally protected activities, fentanyl possession, and three counts of using a firearm in a violent crime. Now, if convicted, Mr. Pena faces a minimum of 60 years in prison. And Joel, let me ask you this first. Does that weight of that mandatory minimum sentence seem appropriate for what he's accused of doing? in your view? It's high, because 60 years federally means 60 years. And I'm certainly wow. not in any way trying to diminish the magnitude mm -hmm. of what occurred. Mm -hmm. And you know, luckily nobody was injured in the course of this, but right. 60 years is a real, real long time. And you see some of the other things. And, and what I think it points out mostly is a very disparate situation between state system and the federal ah, system. We're going to get to that. I and appreciate you pointing that out. So I, I think it's... I think it's high. Actually, it's let me stop sure. you there. Please, if you would, the, the difference, the first one that comes to mind with the, the difference between federal charges and state charges here. Well, the mandatory minimum this is the first one that you yeah. point out. 60 year mandatory minimum really means 60 year mandatory minimum, mm -hmm. of which you'd have to serve at least 85% oh, wow. of that time. Okay. Um, I don't do as much state practice, but I know they don't have similar mandatory minimums associated with that. He wouldn't be serving mm -hmm. nearly as much time, and I think the credit for good time is, is calculated much differently in the states. So. Gotcha. I appreciate that little bit of nuance there. Eric, uh, is there possibly a narrative going on here that our state system is perhaps too soft or too weak compared to what we just heard from Joel about mandatory minimums and things for uh, the federal side of things? It's a perception of our judges and stuff. Is it accurate in your view? Well, normally I, I don't buy into that narrative. Uh, I have to say in this particular case, um, given what we've seen in the legislature, um, even in a democratic state, which has the fifth highest uh, rate of, of gun crime in the, in the country, mm -hmm. the, the reluctance in both parties to do anything really substantial around gun violence. Right. But also I, I do see this linkage with our democracy, right? And, and the fact that this is around an election, um, Again, typically I would say that seems a little bit harsh to me. I wasn't. I haven't always been crazy about using the federal uh, standards for, for for crimes, including mm -hmm. some of the uh, some some of the other sort of uh, uh, initiatives in Albuquerque around ATF and so on. Mm -hmm. In this case, when you have multiple people and sort of an orchestrated uh, sort of uh, hit job, essentially, I happen to know a lot of these folks. They're colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, when when gun violence spills over into elections and a targeting candidates for right. the sole purpose that most of these folks had nothing to do with the election. They just That's happened right. to be in the room when stuff was certified. That's right. um, and, and one of them's a friend and I saw the actual gun, the, you know, the, the actual bullet holes. It's, it's just, to me, it's beyond the pale. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a lock them up and throw sure. away the key. To, and th this, this particular instance, we have to send a strong message. And I do think we have to send a message to gun owners that this isn't just you know people uh, people knocking off liquor stores. These this this is really the, the lethality, the potential lethality in this case. This could have been really really bad for our democracy. Mm -hmm. I forgot to ask you. Uh, please let the folks know what you're doing oh, yes, right now. Yes. Yes. So um, I uh, for the next two weeks. Uh, in full disclosure, I'm I've been advising the mayor on policy, and working on a few issues in the city, um, uh, on the mayor's team. I'm speaking for myself today. Mm -hmm. And moreover, I'm only there a couple more weeks, and so I'll be uh, I'll be uh, liberated. I won't be able to be here because I'll be out of the country for a year. Yeah. Hopefully, not worry about gun violence. That's true. Um, uh, part of the reason we're, we're, we won't be here. But um, <laughs> but anyway, I'm I'm speaking for myself, and I'm not representing the Keller administration. Appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, we've got a situation here when you think about it, where the case has got a lot of publicity, Dan, as you know, uh, from the start. And given the attention, I'm I'm wondering if these incidents are getting a little bit more of a look since the January 6th situation. Does that make sense? Is there a connection here we can see or feel? I, I think so. This case yeah. has certainly had an impact in the legislature. Um, mm -hmm. There's already been um, some push to make it easier for elected officials to um, keep their addresses confidential. Mm -hmm. um, this uh, builds on sort of this ongoing concern. You know, our Secretary of State, the Chief Elections Officer uh, in New Mexico, actually went into hiding, 
you know, after the last election around mm -hmm. the January 6th time um, due to threats. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, there's tremendous concern over how this impacts policymakers and intimidation and mm -hmm. disruption to the democratic process. Right. Um, you know, in terms of gun crimes and violence, you know, those are difficult problems to solve, but That's it's right. something that the legislature certainly is debating intensely. Right. Can I ask a favor of you? Um, I, in our setup, Eric has reminded me, a lot of folks might not know how heinous this stuff was. If you don't know the details of this crime, just a quick recap, the four Democrats that, that were targeted, what happened there? What was Mr. Pena charged with here? And, all that kind of a thing, just in a quick recap, if you would. Well, drive-by shootings that um, mm -hmm. that could have killed somebody, right. uh, but but didn't. So these are pretty terrifying crimes. That's right. Um, you know, it's beyond just uh, calling someone and making a threat. That's something that has happened to mm -hmm. the governor. Has happened to governor candidates, Republicans and Democrats. In this case, though, I mean, you're mm -hmm. you're talking about something that that really could have killed someone, and not just an elected official, but one of their family members. That's right. That's right. It was very frightening. And like you said, there were there was stuff falling off the ceiling onto one of the victim's child in the bedroom. I mean, it was just very close. Joel, let me get to, back to something. I, I'm so glad you're here. Are there any constitutional concerns when you talk about uh, federalizing what has historically been state crimes? There's been a little bit of uh, agita, use a little New York word with you there, uh, about this. Is, is, there a, is that overblown? What, what's your sense of that? Um, I think it's a tough position that both the state and the federal government are in, particularly in this city here. Okay. Um, there's been tremendous overlap between federal and state crimes for, right. for decades now. Right. And now I think it's the executive officials that are choosing to use whatever resources they have available to them. So mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't begrudge them on that. I do think there is more of a federalized creep into what would be local law enforcement okay. issues. I don't necessarily okay. look at this particular one, the Pena one, as, as confined to local law enforcement. I think it goes fundamentally to yeah. voting an election in this country. I mean, one of the things when I was struck by you know, Eric's comments mm -hmm. are, Think of the tone at the top here. Right. When we're talking about just the sanctity yeah. of elections, does it come as a surprise to anybody that something right. like this would happen, be it in New Mexico or elsewhere, when we still have a you know, presidential candidate who is peddling a notion of election fraud mm -hmm. taking place, I don't know how many, you know, several years ago, right. when it's been debunked by even That's his right. closest members, right. but people you know, see that, and that's what we're reading in the papers well, still to this guy to was inspired by it, apparently. That's right. I mean, he was, right. he was regurgitating some of that stuff. I, I just want to add one thing. Please. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're talking about guns and democracy here, and I, I, can't, I can't miss the opportunity to say, you know, in addition to this sort of really egregious, dangerous, over-the-top behavior, mm -hmm. we have a fundamental problem with how our democracy works, and I think the gun issue um, is really demonstrating uh, the flaws in our ability to pass meaningful policies that the, the, the majority of Americans want to keep people safe. You right. know, this is not about elected officials. This is not about motorcycle gangs. I know we're going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. This is not about mental health. Right. This is about guns. I, 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 you know, James Carville had that famous line, it's, you know, it's the economy stupid. It's the gun stupid. Right. The common denominator in all right. of these things right. is not elections. It's not motorcycle gangs. It's not mental health. It's that all of these people right. were able to easily get firearms regardless of their background, yeah. regardless of what state they lived in, um, and it's, it's easier in some states than others, but I think we, we have a real problem and we have to stop coming up with uh, alternative explanations. It's really about the guns. Mm -hmm. It's about the guns, stupid. Mm -hmm. right. Eric, exactly just think right. about for a second though, like the tension that you're talking about, it's a big tension between freedom and security. Right. And that's, I think, what right. we're really seeing and, and the guns are, the prime example of mm -hmm. it. And I know we'll talk more about some of the That's true. Joel, court let, issues soon. Let me, let me ask you something I want Dan to pick up on as well, and that is the mayor during his State of the City address announced that he wants to make downtown Albuquerque a gun-free zone. Uh, this move would essentially send gun-related crimes in that area to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Any, any problems there as you see it, uh, just in its general idea, not so much the details, but your sense of that? I mean, I, I think we've been seeing it first starting with Heller, in 2008, mm -hmm. um, Bruin last year, as far as this kind of individualized right to bear arms, mm -hmm. right, that for some reason took our nation over 200 years to recognize. Right. Um, but now it seems so sacrosanct. Right. So, and, and we're seeing many, many challenges in, at the appellate court level, both um, federally and state, for any legislation that infringes upon 
this notion of an individual's right to bear arms, right. and that it must be grounded in some historical precedent. Right. Just two days ago, out of the en banc opinion, which means the entire Third Circuit, um, invalidated um, a 922G prohibition for an individual who had a nonviolent, what would be considered a felony offense, and said that was unconstitutional because wow. there's no historical precedent to dispossessing nonviolent felons with guns. I think that is a watershed decision, which will most certainly um, be before the Supreme Court as it's created a genuine circuit split. There's a mm -hmm. number of similar issues before our circuit and the Tenth Circuit. So mm -hmm. that's a long way of me saying that I do believe that regardless of um, the wisdom behind Mr. Keller's decision, mm -hmm. that there will certainly be challenges to that notion of yeah. can you restrict somebody's gun rights, be it in a particular, and if it's grounded based on some type of formal historical prohibition. And, I, right. and, I, and, I, and I, I'd be remiss to, to, if I didn't state that somehow we're grounding kind of our modern day view on what people in the 1700s mm -hmm. thought as related to one particular new individual right. That's right. I think if we did that, there would be many, many people who wouldn't be voting. That's right. If That's we right. based it on some historical perspective. Interesting I points I believe there. slavery was yeah. still around in the 1700s That's as well. Right. That's right. Um, so I, I find it, you know, really disingenuous that we're grounding again to, you said it's the gun stupid, and, mm -hmm. and maybe that is, maybe that's what our We'll pick that up about. <laughs> in less than a minute. I'm gonna ask the Red River Mayor, Linda Calhoun, how her city is moving forward after last month's deadly shooting. And then I'll be right back here at the desk with our panel for reaction to that interview.